Welcome, everybody. Uh, we're going to go ahead and get started here. Keynote presentation. I am so uh, honored and excited, and I was excited to even meet Dr. Vicki Rackner, who's giving the presentation. She provides consulting. Uh, she's provided consulting for me, and she's been a huge, huge help in my business. She's provided uh, consulting for medical practices. So uh, today's topic, nine ways practices can generate more revenue. I've actually uh, talked to her about the topic many times. Uh, she's got a book on the topic. She is a tremendous speaker. She came down from Minnesota. They got away from maybe a little bit cooler weather. It's not too bad up there just yet. But I'm uh, really, truly honored to have her here in Albuquerque. Really, really excited that she agreed to do this talk today. So uh, with that, Dr. Vicki, what are you doing? Hey, thanks. So to my son, and I was remembering this time, I was doing a lot of speaking, and um, I was making my second trip out to speak, and he was a few and a half to go, and I said, sweetie, you know, that's how we make money, so I can make sure your baseball bats, and he just looked at me, and he said, me? people actually pay to hear you speak? <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, today what we'd like to do is talk about nine ways to generate more practice revenue. All right, imagine, imagine you have an edge of and you could wave it, and on Monday, you would walk into your ideal practice. What would that look like? What kind of patients would you be seeing? What kind of experience would the patients have? What kind of experience would you have? How would members of your team all work together? So what I do, is I help give a voice to people's dreams and help them try to move closer to it. So we all know that we are functioning in a time of profound change. So trying to figure out how to position yourself for success, not just today, but in the future, can be a bit on the challenging side. And as I think about this task, I think about my dentist, Dr. Doby. He started practicing in 1957. And he said that when he first started practicing, he would spend about half of his days making and fixing dentures. And now he doesn't do any of that anymore. And I sort of wonder, at some point, did he sit down and wonder, how can I get more of those denture patients? No, what he did was he saw the future. And he tried to position himself so that he could anticipate what was coming. And this guy is a fantastic dentist. I, I'm sad thinking about what's going to happen if and when he actually retires. So what I believe is that we are in a point of reinvention. I think the same old stuff probably isn't working very well for you right now. And I think as we move into the future, the question you need to ask yourself is, am I going to be making more dentures, or am I going to be seeing the next big trend? So. I told you I was going to talk about more patients, but really I'd like to talk about the bigger picture. I'd like to talk about how you can get more patients and more revenue and more fun. So you're going to be hearing my own perspectives that you may or may not share. So I just thought I'd share a bit about myself so that you can see how and why I developed these ideas. So if my life had a bumper sticker, it would be heal thyself. So I faced a challenge, I figured it out for myself. And then I help other people who are sharing that same challenge. I describe myself as an accidental surgeon. I was actually a graduate student. When one day I fainted on my way to the bathroom, um, I had an ovarian cyst that was actively bleeding. And by the time I got to the operating room, about half of my blood was in my pelvis. So I really thought I was dying. I remember kissing my then fiance goodbye, thinking, this is the final goodbye. And I was just so grateful to wake up in the recovery room. I knew I was going to be a doctor and save other people's lives like my own had been saved. And not surprisingly, I became a surgeon. Um, I set up a private practice in Seattle and was a clinical faculty at the University of Washington School of Medicine. I've had the honor of treating tens of thousands of patients. My practice quickly evolved into a breast cancer practice. And again, I just feel so humbled and honored to have been able to be with women and some men at that incredible stage in their life. Well, once my practice got settled, it was time for me to start my family. 
I'm facing fertility issues, and I was able to get pregnant with in vitro fertilization. Here's probably the earliest baby picture you've ever seen, eight cells. <laughs> and I operated my whole pregnancy, and I was just given this little bundle of joy. And I looked at him, and I thought, he's perfect. So I had a plan. I was going to bring my son into the office with me. My office manager was the mother of five. I had these side-by-side -side exam rooms, and I converted one of them to a nursery, and I was going to do it all. And I remember, I remember standing, like, right in the hallway, in these two doors, and thinking, well, why do the people want to go through these two doors? Like, when I go into the left to see my patients, my job was to figure out what was wrong. But when I went into on the right, my job was to celebrate what was right. When I went in the door on the left, I was there to fix something. I was there to cure. But when I went in to see my son, my goal was to connect. When I went in to see my patients, I was there to take away their pain. And on some level, I think when I went in to see my son, I thought that my job was to surround him with the problem so that he would never experience pain. And I think that bubble turned into a bubble of denial. It conveniently ignored the comments. He's not sitting on the hill. He's not rolling over yet. But finally, when he was not talking, I knew something was happening. So I pushed my pediatrician for an evaluation, and he was diagnosed with a cause of that. My life sort of came to a halt at that moment. I operated my own pregnancy. I'd done about four days. I'd been exposed to philosophy. I thought, what have I done to my son? So I just went into surgery. It was as though I went into his crib, and these doors kicked him up and brought him into the museum. Now he was somebody I was going to be sure. And I was going to give everything I could to get him. And it didn't work very well. I don't know if you've ever driven in the snow, but you can get stuck in And the tendency is just to push on the accelerator, and you just get more stuck. That's what was happening for me. I mean, what mother can look at her son or father and think of his or her child as broken? So I decided a new approach. So it was like I went in, picked him up, and brought him back to the nursery. I went back into my mother's house, and I figured my job is to help him be most fully who he is and love him for whomever he turned out to be. So I dug in, I learned sign language, I started seeing really the specialness of the other kids in his special classroom, and after a year, he was retested and he was booted out because he had met all of his developmental landmarks. He is 18 now. If you met him, you would never guess. And interestingly enough, when he was first evaluated, the, um, the experts were saying, you know, one of, the, one of the things about him is he's a really good problem solver. And um, I, I will tell you that this, this persists. So when he was about that age, um, we walked by a mother who was nursing her baby. Um, he looked at me and he said, do you breast still make milk? And I said, no. He said, well, I mean, just ventilation. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, um, I had, I had actually had to support my family, right? So I was an expert in medical malpractice policy. And after this really traumatic, tumultuous, life-altering year of age, uh, the question was, what's next? And I thought, well, gee, how many people have had a life-threatening emergency, save other people's lives, and have been a patient and have seen their care goes on track? And I decided to do something totally new. I thought, what if I could help keep care on track? So in 2000, I launched a consulting bridges, a company, Medical Bridges, intended to be the bridge between the kind of care people got care that they wanted. So I was going to help people get better medical outcomes at a lower cost and really nurture this doctor-patient relationship. And like, I wish this was seriously a job. I mean, 
who wouldn't want service like this, right? But I, <laughs> that's not how it happened. I struggled and struggled. I went through savings like you wouldn't believe. And um, I remember being over in Europe giving a talk, and I went to plug in my laptop, and I had an aha moment. Like, you can't plug your laptop in directly, you won't be able to write it. And I thought, that is it. I, as a doctor, am wired differently than business minded people. And what I need to do is figure out that adapter. Like, what's different between doctors and business minded people, or suits and white coats, as I call them? And see if I could adapt my behaviors so that I could plug into these business minded people. And when I did that, really remarkable things happened. I mean, I'm humbled to deliver keynote addresses like this, and I'm so grateful for the opportunity of being with you today. Um, I'm regularly quoted in the National Press. I've written numbers of books. And I'm not telling you this to boast. But just to say that I was exactly the same person before and after. The difference was understanding how other people thought and what was important in their culture. So you might be here as a suit. You might really have great business skills. But I'm here to tell you that if you're a doctor here in the room, or the doctors with whom you work, they think differently than you do. Like, have you ever gotten a birthday present? From somebody, you open it up and you think, I know this is the birthday present that that other person wanted. A lot of the times, that's exactly what happens in your practice. And I'm sure that that's a huge challenge for you. So, my secret sauce is characterizing the differences between the world of business and the world of medicine. And it's a bridge, so it goes with both ways. So, I work with people like Travis who help doctors build wealth, and in a moment, I'm going to tell you why that is so important. I also work with physicians because I believe that unless and until physicians conduct themselves in a more business-minded way, they run the threat of extinction. And so I would not use language like this outside of this group when I'm working with physicians. I use different languages, like how they can serve in a bigger way, how they can leave a bigger legacy. But because you're business-minded people, um, I will share that with you. So I was doing all this, been in business for about eight years, in 2008 most probably. And I had been talking with physicians all along, but I saw some really shocking reality. Like people I personally knew, I personally knew them to be excellent doctors, went bankrupt. There was a relative I had, a distant relative, and I had always been impressed with him when I ran into him at family functions about you know the exotic vacations he was going on in the house and the boat and the jewelry. Well, he died and left his wife penniless, nothing but debt. So when you look at doctors, you don't really know what's going on on the inside because I believe the major difference between a suit and a white coat is the relationship with money. And I'm here to tell you that physicians have a dysfunctional relationship with money, which makes it kind of tough to be a business person, right? All right, so how and why is this the case? And I'm really excited because my next book, Myth of the it's going to be out next month. But here's the headline. Part of the culture of medicine is the idea that the care the patient gets and the patient's ability to pay should be separate. And to keep them separate, we don't talk about money. So I remember very early on in my practice, I saw a patient with C. diff colitis. And he had had it before. He didn't like all the side effects of flatulence, but somebody had just been in my office and told me about an antibiotic that avoided all the flatulence. And so I, I was so excited to tell Alfie about it. He came back and he said, Dr. Ragnar, do you know how much that medication cost? It was $100. And those were $119.90. That was a fortune. And the truth is, I was clueless. I mean, in a sense, 
my practice was kind of like going to a restaurant with a menu with no prices. I was just ordering no wonder healthcare costs sort out of control. And for many physicians, I think that there's this sense that money is free. That like it's below doctors to think about money. And while doctors make good incomes, they do a very, very bad job of building up. Half the physicians today are behind in retirement planning. And many of them are wondering, am I ever going to be able to retire? Am I going to like die in the operating room? Not as a patient, but doing the case. And this could be true of the physicians with whom we work. You just can't tell from the outside what's going on. So, what I'd like to do in this presentation is to talk about the new rules. You know, it's a new time, so what are the new rules? I'd like to talk about the strategic approach, and then we'll talk about some tactical applications, these nine ways that you can generate more revenue. So this is like ready, aim, fire. And I'm so grateful to have the two hours so that we can talk about the rules and the strategy because it makes it much easier for you to bring these ideas back to your practice and decide what's going to work for you. So recently I went to a talk uh, given by a hostage negotiator. And he had us do this exercise where, where we were to pair up and one partner was to clench a fist and the other partner had 10 seconds to get the other person to unclench. So, part of the reason that I went is sometimes I feel like when I'm having conversations about people, about transformations, it kind of feels like hostage negotiation. So, you probably have beliefs about whether or not change is possible in your practice to get to where you want to go. So, I just want to know from you, what kinds of challenges do you feel like you face? You don't want to close this. I want to make sure that I address them in this presentation. So anyone, what keeps you from taking your practice into where you want to be? Reimbursement. Last night, I got an education about the economy in New Mexico. It seems like that would be a major one. And this is a tough one. You can't share problems. However, my belief is that the economic recovery isn't going to come from the top down. What can only be more successful and more profitable? And only you will be able to do the best thing you can do. I think that recovery is coming from the top down. And I think you will be able to change the job to help with this. Um, is it okay if I list some of them that you said? Okay. Resistance from physicians. Many of you brought ideas to your doctors and they just said, uh-huh, that's not the way it's going to be done. No. Anything else? Uh, patient engagement or involvement. Excellent. <laughs> Well, what do you mean by that? Um, getting them as committed to their treatment, uh, getting them committed to successful treatment. Sometimes they want to have to a lot of patients who want to be built in the next seven years. They don't want to the work that it takes to see their treatment. Absolutely. That's right, isn't it? That's right. Yeah. All right, anything else? Uh -huh. Frustrating. Not very respectful, right? Not respectful then. Uh, what about them?
all right, I'm hearing frustration. And I'm hearing you talk problems that impact your day-to-day -day life. I wish I had a job, and if you're just here, do this. But you're sophisticated enough to know that there are some things that we are not going to use to change. It's going to require other people. So what I want to focus on today is what can we do? And then maybe we can sort of brainstorm about what would some systems solutions be? Can Andrew and May be part of the solution? Can the doctors company be part of the solution? So let's talk about the new rules first. So as you know, the Affordable Care Act is the most sweeping health care change in the past 50 years since LBJ signed Medicare into law. And while I don't want to talk about the politics of the Affordable Care Act, what I can tell you is that for successful practices, there is no upside. The only thing that's happened is downside for the practices. And the downside is seen in terms of falling reimbursement, rising expenses, and costly regulatory changes. So this is tough. And then this is happening in the context of a broader economic challenge. So your patients, members of your community, don't have the resources that they used to and they don't know what the future is going to hold. And after watching last night's uh, debate, I'm not sure either. But, so that's on the downside. But there are other forces that are equally as compelling. And this is where I get the optimism. So we are at a time of incredible innovation. I mean, there was a time when things were very different. My mother was in a car accident in the 1960s, and her doctor prescribed smoking so she would lose weight to help with her back pain. Um, George Washington, he had one natural tooth when he was inaugurated. What happened to his teeth? Well, he had all sorts of illnesses like malaria and vein fever, and he got the best treatment at the time, which was a mercury-based medication that eroded his teeth. Today, a child born has a very good chance of not having a single cavity. And we're seeing this kind of innovation in all sorts of ways. There's LBJ showing off his lap pulley scar, or his um, incision from his cholecystectomy, and now what the post-operative belly looks like from the lap pulley. And this is a metaphor for what's happening in medicine. Less invasive, more easily tolerated. Faster recovery, and this is what patients want. They want that magic pill. But short of the magic pill, they want better, more invasive, less invasive. Second big force is access, and I think the single thing that transformed medical practice is Dr. Google. Things were never the same after that, because previously, physicians and medical practices were the gatekeepers of medical information. Now patients can go on the internet and find all sorts of information, and there's no way to screen it, tell the difference between good information and bad information, and most importantly, what does this information mean for me? So I have patients who would come into the emergency room, I've got appendicitis, well, how do you know? Well, I was on Mayo.com, 
And it says, and I thought, that is really interesting because even after I do a history and do a physical exam, I often don't know if somebody has appendicitis. This is huge. Further, patients now have access to diagnostic and therapeutic information that they never had before. I mean, when I first started my practice, all of my patients were referred by primary care doctors. Today, patients can just go on the internet and order all sorts of information. So my dad's wife um, was shopping, and uh, there was this little lab set up. She could go in and get her lab done. Well, her brother had been diabetic. She wanted to figure out if she was diabetic. So she went in. And you know how you order things to get a deli sandwich? Like she just checked off the labs that she wanted cheap. I mean, she's not a healthcare professional. And they called her because she had a dangerously high level of potassium. And she called me in a panic. What do I do? And I knew that it was probably because the tourniquet had been on too long. But I said, okay, here's what you do. You go to the doctor. So she thought she was saving money and really doing something great. When in fact, that, that human judgment, the absence of that human judgment really caused a lot of problems. I don't know if you remember where um, the time when people could get full body scans to see if they had cancer. I cannot tell you how many adrenal masses that we took out, the nine adrenal masses, because they were there. And what do you do once you find out whether or not they're there? So this is, this is happening. The world is flat now. Last year, almost a million Americans not the U.S. to get their health care involved. So right now, it's not just you that the patients can choose. They can go anywhere in the world for their care. And we're also in a time of greater transparency. So patients have more financial skin in the game, and it's easier than ever for them to go online and figure out what things cost. Now, I don't know about you, but if somebody asked me, how much does it cost to have a mastectomy? I couldn't answer because it depends. But more and more, there are places that will give patients prices for procedures and operations. There's also transparency about what patients think about you. They're going online and talking about their experience with you. And I hope that you are proactively managing your online reputation. So this is working for you and not against you. In addition, there's greater transparency about outcomes. Now, I spent the past 30 years in Seattle. And if you're going to have a heart attack, you want to do it in Seattle because you have about twice the chance of surviving. Atul Kawanda wrote this great book called Better. And um, he talked about the outcome with patients with cystic fibrosis. So this is a relatively new disease. And there is a treatment protocol, but what he discovered is that some institutions have significantly longer lifespan. Like the average lifespan with this protocol is 37. But in a place in Minnesota, it's 47. So patients have more and more information about what kind of outcomes are gotten where, and it's influencing their choices. So in the language of real estate, what I would argue is that we have made a transition from a seller's market to a buyer's market. Medical practices used to be in control, they used to be in the driver's seat, but now patients are in the driver's seat more and more often. And it's estimated that 80% of referrals are driven either directly or indirectly by patients. So yes, you may get a referral from a primary care office, but what's underneath that is the patient has talked with his or her bodies and said, I want to go to this place, right, for referral to this place. This is huge. This is a complete transformation. When I first started my practice, I built relationships with primary care doctors because that's how I got my patients. It's a brand new world now. So. I used to think that patients came to my practice, and I was in a solo private practice. They came to private practice because they wanted me to operate on them. They wanted me to care for them. But what I'm seeing more and more is that patients are choosing their health care, much like people are choosing 
with whom they want to fly. So the doctor is sort of like the pilot, and I'm going to fly home tonight. I think people assume that they're going to get safely from point A to point B. I think in the eyes of patients, they assume that they're going to get reasonable health care no matter where they go. So how do they decide where to make their health care? The same kinds of things that we do when our, we're planning our vacation. They choose on the basis of cost and convenience. And maybe there's some kind of member program. So th this is really important. This is a fundamental change. And let me just show you how and why this works. So I was involved with the project to decrease the incidence of chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting. I mean, nausea and vomiting is terrible, right? It's, a, it's just terrible. I mean, I gotta have pretty much any other kind of pain than nausea and vomiting. But the thing is, this could be almost completely avoided. So we went and we interviewed patients. About 80% of them said that they had chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting. Then we interviewed the physicians. Guess what percent said that their patients had chemotherapy and dysfunction problem? 20%. So there's this disconnect between a patient's reality and what actually happens. And how and why does this happen? Well, I think cancer patients are so grateful to be given back their life that they don't want to complain about something like nausea and vomiting. It would sort of be like, my knocking the door on, on the cockpit of the plane and asking the pilot for water. I mean, he's got more important things to do, right? But now, patients get to go online and see this cancer facility really paid attention to every little detail. So these kinds of things are now influencing patients' choices. So I believe doctor-patient relationships very foundation of our healthcare system. That's where our focus has to be. Historically, there has been a transformation in the nature of the doctor-patient relationship, and it's sort of like the relationship between a parent and a child. So, operated on elderly patients who told me that in the 40s and 50s, doctors would make decisions like, oh, she's too fragile to know that she has cancer. And so they adopted this paternalistic idea about what patients can and should know. Like, just like a parent taking care of an infant. And I think over time, this relationship has evolved into a more adult-adult collaboration. But what's drastically new right now is that money has entered the doctor-patient relationship. So previously, as I mentioned, there was this idea that there should be a separation, and that is not happening anymore. Doctors are expected to understand the financial burdens of their patient and help patients make informed choices. And this is the way it should be. If you, when I make choices about my health care, I ask them, how much is it going to cost and what are we going to do differently as a result? spending this money. The reason I do this is I often spend thousands of dollars on my bed and not done one single thing differently. So costs count and physicians, for physicians, money is the ultimate taboo topic. And not paying attention to taboo topics has consequences. You know, patients, there are some things that patients don't like to talk about. I call them the embarrassing P's. Peeing, pooping, and procreating. And I had a patient who literally died of embarrassment. She was too embarrassed to tell the doctor about the blood in her stool. And by the time the colon cancer, which how that blood was diagnosed, it was too late. It was wiping her stat. So physicians are going to need a new set of skills. They're going to need to overcome their discomfort and acquire these new skills. All right, so bottom line, patients are behaving like consumers. And if they are behaving like consumers, that means that successful practices understand that they are running businesses.
So what is the difference between a small business and a medical practice? Well, there's, there's some core differences. One is the metric by which you measure success. For small businesses, it's about financial outcomes. But for medical practices, it's about clinical outcomes. How are my patients doing? Am I making a difference? Now, it's not one or the other, but we're looking at how physicians see their practice and how a business person would see his or her practice. The next is how do you prepare for success? Will people who run small businesses get training in sales and marketing and finance? And those are like the scary things for me when I made my transformation. Medical practices get trained about how to diagnose and treat disease. Now, I think both people are going to need both sets of skills because any good business is able to diagnose what the source of their client's pain is. And physicians and medical practices are going to need to know these basic sales and marketing and finance skills. All right, now let's talk about the stakeholders. Like, who are you trying to influence? Well, for small businesses, it's the consumer, right? And normally, the person who sends them their way to buy an Apple computer, the people who use the product, and the people who write the check are the same person. But in our healthcare system, there are complex triangulated relationships. So think about how patients actually come with their way to you. Is that your customer, the person who's sending you the patient? Is it the insurance company who's writing you the check? Or is it the person who's actually benefiting from the patient care? And this is not just an academic exercise. Because the rules in business is the consumers exchange money for the things that they value. So if you want to make more money, you deliver more value. If your buyer is the insurance company, if you're seeing that at the insurance company, you're going to behave in one way. If you think your referring physicians are your consumer, you're going to behave in another way. And if you think that it's your patient, you're going to take your practice in a different direction. So this is really important, getting clarity about this. So the tough thing about this is that value, like beauty, is in the eyes of the people. So the value that you deliver is not the thing that you think the patient needs, it's actually the thing that the patient wants. So our challenge with compliance, for example, is understanding how to inspire a patient to collaborate with us and take medication as prescribed. Right now it happens about 50% of the time. It's estimated that we could decrease our healthcare spending by up to 80%, 8-0, by getting patients to adopt healthcare lifestyle choices. So our role in leadership, understanding our patients, and knowing how to inspire them to do the things that they want to do is on us, I think. Um, and I will just tell you that patients value different things than you do. They look at things differently. You are there to meet medical objectives. Patients are there to meet personal objectives. Like, I knew I should exercise regularly. Yeah, I should do this, I should do that. But what made me actually do it? It was when my son was born. Because what was important to me was to model the kind of behavior that I wanted my son to adopt. So, you know, no argument about, you know, my risk of heart not A medical objective would not influence me. And if you can understand patients' personal objectives, what they truly value, you're in a much better chance of getting the outcomes that anyone wants. And if you want to make more money in a business model, you just deliver more value. It is that easy. So you figure out what your buyer wants. You clearly articulate it so they understand the value that you're getting. And you deliver more. And it's the job of the business to articulate this value. So our jobs as healthcare providers is to show patients how we're making a difference and then help them understand and frame the value. What, what is the value to you of being able to walk 
your granddaughter um, down the aisle. If you were to assign a, a price to that, what would it be? Now, how much do you pay in homeowner's insurance? And how would you value you know, your home versus being around to be able to contribute to your family? If we can learn to have these kinds of conversations, I think it's going to make it easier for patients to make good choices. So as I told you, I spent 30 years in Seattle. And Nordstrom's service is just legendary. There are books written about it. And I would really recommend taking a look at this book, The Nordstrom's Way to Customer Service Excellence. Because I think we are all in the customer service business these days. And by the way, you're going to get a copy of these slides. <clears throat> and I think that, now, you just said something so beautifully last night. You talked about welcoming your guests into your home. And I think that that's such a great metaphor. Like, what if your practice were like your home? And every time a patient came in, you were welcoming the patient into your home. How would you treat a distinguished guest? All right. So I believe that those are the new rules. Do you guys concur with this? Is this the way you're seeing it, too? Or are you seeing it differently? Anyone have any thoughts or comments about it? Any other rules that you're seeing? Uh huh. Okay, so, and I agree with that, and I'm going to offer gentle pushback and say they can see you, but their out-of-pocket expenditure is higher. I think we need to get unstuck from this idea that the insurance company is in charge. This is a free country. Patients do have autonomy, and they do have the opportunity of paying out-of-pocket to see you, and I think it's our job to remind patients of that. You know, the insurance company is not in control, you are. Uh -huh. I, I hear you, and here's what I believe the core challenge is. I think most patients hold this idea that Medicare or that healthcare is free, right? Um, they say that their health insurance is already expensive. But if you really think about it, if you think about what the value of your health is and how much health insurance costs versus like car insurance or home insurance, I mean I value my health a lot more than I value my car. So why, So what I believe is that we're going to go through a phase where we're going to start to think about health care costs in a new way. And I, I know that this sounds odd to you. I know it sounds odd. But more and more patients are saying, this is important to me. I am willing to spend money where it's important. I remember, I remember the first time, I'm a big library user, I remember when the librarian stopped stamping the book, or the first time I had to pay spirit air to bring luggage with, carry luggage on board, or the first time I pumped gas, I sort of, what's going on here? This isn't the way it should be. And I think that that's the response that we're getting right now from patients. It should be free. I, I already pay enough. But I think that this is going to be changing. I think this is going to kind of be like a pump in the gas. I may or may not be right. Uh huh? Say, well, that's a patient that has a choice. 
They have narrowed. However, now this is another crazy idea. What I believe is that there's going to be sort of a parallel healthcare system that's built. And it's going to be a cash-based system. And patients are going to be able to decide. You know, I spent some time operating in Israel. And there is the public health insurance policy, not fully. And you wait a long time sometimes to get the care. And so there were private practice doctors. And they cost money, but for the right person, it was worth it. Now, not every patient is going to make the right choice, right? I mean, some people would prefer shopping at Walmart or Costco. But there are other people who want to go to the high-end you know, grocery store. So I think, I think the challenge is sort of deciding who you are, what kind of experience you want to offer, and then attracting those patients that are really good. Um, yes, back there. I absolutely agree with you. And I will tell you that when I made this transition, like I didn't get how much I didn't know. And I've spent about as much on my business and marketing training as I did in medical school. And I spent about as much time developing these skills too. I really honor business people. I honor people with the business sense. And as I look to the future, what I see is that it's about the of fit. So there are some physicians who are really best served by being employees. They love patient care. And this is really the environment in which they thrive. But if you've got a physician committed to private practice, I think they, they will quickly understand that this business stuff is ignored at their own peril. Uh -huh.
It is overwhelming. It is overwhelming. And I'm, I'm a student of success. And if you study high-performing executives like Bill Gates, he would just leave. He would be dropped down on an island. Food would be wrong. And he had a week to just think. And, and this is what people do. You know, people who launch new businesses understand that it takes time and energy to set a strategic vision and then figure out how to get there. And where will a doctor get it? And how do you create this culture so everyone's on board? And I just really uh, appreciate the wisdom of what you're saying. That is a great question. And what I will tell you is it has to do with the volume of information that they have to master. Like, I would go to bed at night. Or think, you know, somebody would invite me to go to a movie. And I would think, you know, I really should be studying. You know, I can kill a patient one day if I don't study this. So there's, there's an exploding volume of medical information. And this business stuff is just considered soft. It's, you know, I remember when I was going out in private practice, I had this moment of clarity and I thought to myself, what do I know about running a practice? And my mentor said, well, you can balance a checkbook, don't you? Well, you know, you can run a medical practice. It's not that hard. So it's, it's a triage question. You know, there's so much information. A physician's primary goal is taking good care of patients. And I will tell you that I believe that medical schools talk about the treatment of disease at the expense of health promotion. And I think that's really what patients want to know. They don't necessarily want to know how to move away from things that they don't want. They want to know how to move towards that healthy life that they want. I got four hours of nutrition. Uh -huh. I get what you're saying that you're saying. Same thing. Some of the goals that we come to life with some of the insurances, they want to be really good at all. And the reason I say that is because So I hear what you're saying, and, and here's a little story I'm going to say in response. So I had a house fire a couple of weeks before Katrina hit. My dryer malfunctioned, and the switch that's supposed to turn off failed, and like my whole house went up in flames. And so I had to have temporary sheltering until my house was rebuilt. And I think we're sort of in the house fire stage right now. We're seeing the devastation. And we're going to have a temporary solution. But what I'm thinking about and what I'm talking about today is this rebuilt house. What's that going to look like? And I understand there's a lot of pain from getting where we are today to getting there. But if we can hold that vision of what that there is, what we really want, and then just think about, okay, am I doing what I can to get to where I want to go? Sort of what I'm thinking. Um, all right, so to get there, I think we need a new mindset. And I think all of you are talking about this. So each of you has beliefs about what healthcare should look like, what patients should do, and what everyone's role is. And I think that we will all agree that the ideal healthcare system 
helps you serve in a bigger way and create a bigger impact and leave a bigger legacy. So how to get there? Well, it's based on your beliefs. And if you take a look at any one piece of information that you believe, like doctors shouldn't talk to patients about money, it falls in one of these pie wedges. There are things that you know you know, and there are things that you know you don't know. That's kind of the safe zone. Unfortunately, there are other places, like things that you don't know you don't know, or know that you know that you're wrong, or know that you know and ignore. And when you're trying to help somebody make a transformation, they may have an assumption that they know to be true that you know not to be true. So challenging assumptions and being willing to suspend the beliefs that you hold about how things are or how they should be, I believe will facilitate this transformation. This transformation is going to require some new skills too. And these skills terrify me. Marketing and selling and leading. When I thought about selling, and that was one of my big challenges when I started my consulting company, I sort of thought of Billy Mays, hey, come on down and get your mastectomy. We've got a special bilateral mastectomy for the price of one. You know, I just <laughs> I couldn't see myself doing that. So I had to find a way for myself that was acceptable to me. So what I decided is, okay, marketing is just engaging people in conversation. And we all know how difficult that is just because of all the noise out there. And then selling is inspiring people to take action. So you sell when you get your kid to take out the garbage, when you encourage your partner to go on vacation, when you want to go on vacation. So we market and sell every day, and it's kind of like a heartbeat. Look up, look up, look up. Any time we're going to get something done, it's because we've marketed and sold. So how do you get better at these things? And I am coming to believe that emotion drives motion. The neurobiologists are telling us that most of our behavior is intended to help us to achieve a desired emotional state. And each of us has an emotional home. Some people like being in control. I think you will agree that your physicians like being in control. Some people like belonging. If you look at your nursing staff, that's probably the primary emotion that drives things. Some people want to feel smart. They want to be right. So if you walk into somebody's office and you see the words all around, that's the person who wants to feel smart. And some people want to be valued. And part of the reason that physicians get in trouble is that they purchase the trappings of wealth rather than building true wealth. So if you can figure out what's driving somebody and you can help them achieve their desired emotional state, you're much more likely to be successful. Leadership is also an important, and I love this definition by Covey. Leadership is communicating to people their worth and potential so clearly that they are inspired to see it in themselves. So self-leadership is important. What do we do really well? Leading others is important, and also coaching patients to lead themselves, I think, is important. In the way I see it, and this is what I heard here, in most practices, physicians are the leaders. They set the culture, they set the priorities, and the organization will ideally reflect the values and beliefs of the leader. And I think that we, as healthcare professionals, want to show patients and their family care how they can assume self-leadership for their health. Um, so, you know, leadership is a skill that can be developed, and there are all sorts of ways of communicating this. Um, and I have on my site this connection prescription, which is a simple set of leadership skills. I figured if lay people could be taught how to do CPR, there should be a simple system for establishing leadership, and that's what this connection prescription is. Now there are some actions. And um, what I'd like to describe to you is what I call the Thriving Doctors Bootcamp. I know that this is a lot. How are we doing? Okay. 
Awesome. All right, so every time a patient comes to your office, there's an algorithm for dealing with that patient. There is history, you sit down and listen to the history, you do the exam, then you do the assessment and the plan. There's a system. So this thriving doctor's blueprint is a system to help you get to where you want to go, and I'll just go through this real quickly. Um, step number one is find your sweet spot. So I took my son out shopping for that, and there was one that was really expensive, and I just turned to the salesperson and I said, why is this so expensive? He said, well, it has a big sweet spot. I said, what's the sweet spot? And my son said, well, that's where the gap hits and you get a home run. So you have a sweet spot, too. What are you doing where you get your home runs? What do you really love doing? And the sweet spot is that place where your personal and professional and financial goals all seem to come to a point. So what is it for you? What are you doing when time stands still? What patients are you perfectly suited to serve? Um, maybe it's a certain procedure. I've got a buddy who loves replacing mitral belts. That is his gift. He's really, really good at it. Um, I have another friend who likes dealing with children who have post-traumatic stress disorder. And she goes out and writes and speaks about it. It's her passion. Um, some people's gift is creating an experience. The culture I created in my practice was I wanted everyone to come in my practice and sort of feel like they were sitting down at the kitchen table with a friend. I didn't want this formality between myself and the patient. And so I built a culture around that idea. So what is it for you? And Again, I think that the secret to success is this goodness of fit. Because once you understand where your sweet spot is, your goal is to spend more time in your sweet spot and less time outside of your sweet spot. How do you figure out where your sweet spot is? Well, the great paradox is that your areas of giftedness come so easily that you think, this is so easy, like everyone can do it. I remember going over to my friend's house, and her house was Absolutely beautiful. It was like so no I said, How did you do this? Well, I just did it. Doesn't everyone do it? And a friend of mine came over, and um, we were both single mothers. Our kids were the same age, and I really enjoyed cooking. So, um, you know, she said, like, how, do you, how do you cook like this? It, it's so hard, but for me, it was an area of joy. And, and we collaborated in a way that she would take care of the kids. Like, she would take the kids out and do something fun so that I could spend time doing what I wanted to do. She was really gifted with the kids. They would make play or whatever. It was perfect. It was a perfect symbiotic relationship. So how do you figure out where your sweet spot is? Well, here's a couple little tips. You can ask people who know you well, if I were on the cover of a magazine, what would the magazine be and what would the article be about? Or if you could only call one person under what circumstances, would you give me a call? Uh, okay, step number two is gather intelligence. So what you want to do is you want to get into the mind of your ideal patient. So what's important to them? What do they value? Um, an excellent book that I would highly recommend is by the Heath brothers called Made to Stick. And the book is about why do some really good ideas stick around and others go? In it, he talks about the curse of knowledge, and we all suffer from it. So we have this pool of expertise, and it's easy to forget what it's like not to have that expertise. And to illustrate this, he talks about the clamping experiment. So I could clap out the song, and you could guess what it is. And let's just do it now. You got it, right? There you go. All right. Not everyone gets it, though. And that gets to be really frustrating when somebody else doesn't get it. So try to get into the mind of a patient. And remember, patients are different than you are. They're outside of their comfort zone. They're not sick very often. This is a unique experience. This is 
This is where you feel comfortable. So you are different. Failure to understand where patients are has consequences. And I will confess to you my $40,000 mistake. So it always bugged me when patients would come in and I would ask about medication. Oh, I take that little pink pill. Well, what for? The doctor prescribed it. Or, you know, I would be examining somebody and I would put my finger up and down in the decision. What happened here? I don't know. And I thought, you know, how, how are patients going to get good care if they don't take responsibility and sort of know their story? Well, at the time, I was working on this chicken soup book about heart disease, and I had this flash of insight. Maybe the reason that patients don't own their medical story is because it's the doctor's version of the story. But what if I helped patients own their story and told their version of their story? And um, I was coming back from a speaking engagement, and a passenger um, quoted this heart stop right there. And he was traveling alone. Um, there was nothing in his wallet that could, could give us any clue about what was going on. I said, that is it. I, I'm going to do something about this. So I decided to create this personal health journal. So it's a place where patients can keep their own version of their story. And there was a little card that patients could fill out and worksheets about how to work with the doctor. And I'm, of all of the things I've written, this is actually the one I'm most proud of. So it was around Christmas time, I got myself kind of on a radio show a day to talk about healthcare consumerism. And um, the host all loved it. And you'd say things like, everyone needs to get this as a Christmas present. I started thinking, like, did I order enough of these? Do you want to guess how many I sold? The reason was that I, as the expert, knew what somebody needed, but I didn't know what they want. And in a patient's mind, the medical record, taking care of the medical record, was the doctor's job. Patients did not want to deal with that. I was trying to create the want, um, and I was unsuccessful. So understanding where people are at is important. And just really to drive this home, what I'd like you to do is just focus on that blinking green light at the center of the screen. Just focus on the heart. Really look at it. Now, what's happening to the yellow dots? They go in and out. So they're, they're all there. This, this optical illusion is something called motion-induced blindness. And it's something that pilots know. They know that if they focus on a point on the horizon and don't constantly scan the horizon, they're going to miss things with which they could collide. And here's why this is important for this conversation. You are the expert. You know what patients want to do. That's your blinking green light. From the patient's perspective, though, let's say the yellow light in the upper right hand corner is their blinking green light. Unless you put your focus where their focus is, you run the risk of being wrong. Okay, so in the gathering intelligence phase, you want to basically know three things. Why do patients come to you? Why do they stay with you? And who's the competition? And the competition isn't necessarily the doctor down the street, but it's if they don't get care with you, what are they doing? Are they going to the drugstore and get some over the counter confirmation? Are they going to a chiropractor or an advocate? How are they dealing with the problem that you solve? And based on all of that information, you are now in a much better position of engaging patients by doing a makeover. And in the makeover, you set this vision. You set the strategic vision. You know, who are you? What value deliver? And why do you do it? And you know, as I mentioned before, there's not just one place that you can go and buy clothes or buy groceries. You have a lot of different choices. And Neiman Marcus operates differently than Target. They know who they are. So who are you? What kind of experience do you deliver? What kinds of problems do you solve? Okay, so the first thing you gotta do is figure out um, the answer to the question, what do you do? And there's basically three ways of answering that question. First is by title, because we all have titles, right? Neurologists, ophthalmologists, um, 
women's health. The problem with that, though, is that patients don't necessarily know what that means or they have different ideas. And some of you heard the story last night, but I was at a family wedding. This little 10 year old girl comes over to me and she said, I hear you're not the right. Yep. What kind of doctor? Surgeon. What kind of surgeon? General surgeon. Or the person who puts the warning labels on the cigarette pack. <laughs> <laughs> so when you talk about your title, you never know what pops into their head. You can also talk about maybe the procedure you do or the diagnosis that, that you help with. The problem though is a lot of people that need your help don't necessarily know that they've got that diagnosis. So I think the best way to talk with patients and to answer this question is to say, I help a certain group of people to achieve a certain outcome. So let's say you're dealing with sleep apnea. I help people who are tired perform better at work and be more present for their family. You're an orthopedic surgeon. I help people get back to the tennis court they love. So the focus is really on the patients and what the patients want. Next there is the image, and image does matter. So maybe you need to glam it up or clean it up or trim it down. But positioning and branding really does make a difference. So the California Broom Growers were looking at saving sales. And they thought, what are we going to do? So they hired a PR firm who just repositioned them as Dwight Plunks and the sales sword. <laughs> so how are you positioned right now? And could you do better? Um, you know, what does your website look like? Do you have a uniform? Um, what is your visual image? Does your website and your letterhead and your Facebook banner, do they all match? Like if somebody got something from you, do they know it's you? Um, step number four is launching marketing campaigns to avoid being the best kept secret in town. So what I believe is the strategy of building relationships by delivering value. So where do your patients come from? You need patients in order to make money. So I sort of think about three buckets of people. The first are family, friends, and fans. People who already know you, like you, and trust you. How many of people in your family, or at church, or in your neighborhood, know the unique value that you offer. They might know somebody who needs exactly what you have to offer. Do, do people around you really know? Next there are senders, or centers of influence. Um, so for me, the sender was the primary care doctor. But where do you get your patients? For your centers. Maybe it's a teacher or a coach or somebody who sells bras at Nordstrom's. Who are these people who sort of align with who you are? And last, there are information seekers. There are people out on the internet looking for answers to problems. So, you know, they might go ahead. How do I get through menopause? How do I deal with shoulder pain? How do I manage back pain? And what if they type in that Google search and they came up with a video that your practice created or an article or a special report? I think that this is really the future. Um, more and more patients are out on the internet. If you understand what keywords they're putting into the bar and you've got something with those keywords, you will be found. Okay, then there are three kinds of marketing campaigns. Um, relationship marketing, educational marketing, and community marketing. So relationship marketing is where you go out and build strategic relationships. And there are actually people you can hire to go out and do that for you. They will go out and identify um, the practices or the people who are the best fit for you. And for the practices that use it, I mean, this works really, really well. Then there's educational marketing, where you build a relationship by delivering high-value educational content. I think that this is the best fit for doctors. 
The word doctor comes from the Latin word for educators. Doctors are teachers. And what if they package their teaching and put it out there? I mean, I've been doing that for years. It's incredibly rewarding. And it's incredibly easy because your doctors probably have spiels that they can say in their sleep. What if you capture this on videotape? And the next time a patient is interested in these questions, they would find you. Then there's community marketing. There are some physicians who are there and practices who are very skilled <laughs> at creating a community around the disease, uh, around a cause, and you could potentially do that. I know one physician is absolutely passionate about ending hunger. And so in the office, there are people who collect food and distribute food. Um, there are other people who want to distribute the like, best information about a disease like diabetes. So you can form a community ar around that. All, of, all three of these work if executed correctly. And the big question is, you know, what's the best fit for you? So let me give you, I mean, some, some ways of reaching out or an e-newsletter. Now, you've all got patients' email addresses, right? How many of you are sending out an e-newsletter? Just little tidbits about how they can get healthier. How's that working? And what kinds of things do you write about? Awesome. Awesome. That's perfect. That's absolutely perfect. We talked about these videos. Um, when I was building my practice, I would host um, seminars for women and talk about breast cancer. Um, I've had other people who will host educational events for um, reporting physicians. Um, there's social media outreach. How many people here have social media marketing campaigns? And how's it working for you? That's where the patients are. And then the great thing is, is that you can find pockets of people and target them. That's actually what the pharmaceutical industry is spending a lot of their money doing. Um, I think that testimonials are actually probably one of the most important things to be doing. How many of you get patient testimonials? Yeah? All right. So patients are very sophisticated consumers. And I think we're all reluctant to believe self-claims. So you, know, you can have a banner at the top of your website, Center of Excellence. But if you've got patients telling the story about how great you are, that's a completely different thing. And so I think that there's a very gracious way of approaching patients about this. Um, you can say, you know, I'm so happy that you got a kind of you did. There are people out there who don't know us. They don't know if we're a good fit. And would you be willing to help them out by just sharing some thoughts about what it was like to deal with that practice? So you're framing it in terms of service. And you know, what if, what if somebody arrived at your website and there were four patient reviews, just glowing patient reviews? Um, and next, I think we can coach patients to leave reviews on these online sites. I mean, they may or may not want to do it. Again, doing this in the spirit of service, I think, can be very, very helpful. Um, all right. Um, just some case studies. Um, I was working with a woman who had launched a breast imaging center, and she wanted and needed new patients stat. So I had a conversation with her. When patients come in, oh, when a friend has been diagnosed with breast cancer. And so we launched this campaign, Friends Don't Let Friends Get Mammograms. Highly effective. She also offered discounts for the family and friends of breast cancer patients. Um, I wanted to get more patients for an orthodontist. Um, his ideal patient was an adult. So I asked him, when do adults get braces? He said, well, when they get married and when they look for jobs. Great. We had him partnering with wedding planners and boutiques and got discount coupons for his services. He went to job seekers and did the same thing. Um, more patients for an orthopedic surgeon who did a shoulder procedure. Okay, I asked him, 
Where do you get your patients from? Um, and we started reaching out to coaches and athletes and um, teachers. Um, all right, so next step is cultivate a culture of introductions. And I would so agree with this idea that you are creating a culture. And these cultures really do vary. So my son loves baseball, and we would regularly go to uh, Seattle Mariners games. And um, in the moment of parenting glory, right before they tore down Yankee Stadium, I took him there. We went and saw a game at Yankee Stadium. And the Seattle fans are really, really polite. And the Yankee fans, have you guys ever been to a Yankee Stadium? I mean, there were people who were calling out, you bounced to their own team. And so we went to the Yankees game. Then we went back to Safeco Field to see another Mariner game. And the pitcher wasn't doing very well. And the Seattle response said, oh, you'll get him next time. But my son yells out, send them back to the minors. And like 360 degrees of face was just glared at him because that is not the culture there. So what is your culture? And is part of your culture inviting people to send you clients? All right, so let me just say one thing about the difference between marketing and advertising. So the way I see it, marketing is talking about somebody else. It's putting them in center stage. And advertising is shining the light on yourself, right? So it's kind of like going over to somebody's house for dinner, and you might bring a nice bottle of wine or flowers, something that the host would enjoy. Or you could bring your vacation pictures, because you're excited about your vacation pictures. All right, so advertising is a lot more expensive than marketing. Advertisers do a great job of trying to sell you advertising, because their job is selling advertising. Right? OK, so marketing, in general, is a lot better use of your budget. However, for the first time in my entire career, I am exploring Facebook ads, and here's why. You can target people. So let's say you have a seminar, and you wanted to get your message in front of a certain group of people. Facebook can help you do this with actually alarming specificity. You can say, I want to reach people with in this age group with this level of income, and you can get your message there. It's new. I'm still working out the tweaks, but I'm going to predict that this is going to be a really effective way of attracting patients. OK, um, so I've got um, Travis and I um, have collaborated on this ebook, How to Get More Patients Starting Today. You can contact Travis and get a copy of this um, with our thanks. And I've also got another ebook about how to enhance your medical magnetism so you can attract more people. OK, so the money. The money. How do you generate more revenue? All right, so there are basically three kinds of strategies for generating more revenue. You can make more money, you can keep more money, or you can lose less money. And let's talk about these. Making more money. So how would you do that? I think one of the best ways to do it is through focus. Not trying to be all things to all patients, but really get in that sweet spot and become known. And I get a lot of feedback. Wait a minute. If I focus, I'm going to be excluding patients. How can that possibly help me get more profitable? The answer is it does. That's the experience. And the, the best example that I know is a dentist I met on an airplane focuses on patients who are full that just don't want to deal with patients like that. And patients will drive up to hours to get to you. So if you don't have something for which you really well know, chances are better that you are going to attract those people because people want to go to the experts. An example of this is the Schulweiss Clinic up in Canada. They do one procedure. They repair hernias in one bite. And this focus allows them to get such great results that my mentors say they must be lying about their data. The focus helps you get better outcomes. And if you can boast about better outcomes, it makes it easier to attract more patients. It makes it easier to do things more 
efficiently, and you just do it better. So I invite you to think about, do you have a focus? Number two is add cash services. Now, I put out my umbrella here as you uh, help me with questions. But I think that you guys want to be in control of your financial destiny. The only way to do that is to get unplugged from insurance payments. You can do it on a little basis, or you can do it on a big basis. But if you want to be in control, this is something that I recommend. So let me give you an example. My son's pediatrics practice, one of the pediatricians has an ADD. And um, he, he was just tired of the insurance stuff. So he decided to launch an all-cash practice. And he is killing it. So he does an initial evaluation. He um, does med management, behavioral changes, and coaching for parents. He loves it. It's working great for him, and it's working great for the families, too. So are there ways that you can add cash services? Do you want to administer both? Um, do you want to maybe put in a formulary in-house? Um, do you want to think about launching a membership site? I think that spending some time thinking about this is going to be the solution in the future. Um, there are all sorts of things. Travel medicine, telemedicine. Um, maybe you even have an app. Maybe you've got some device that you want to launch. You want to be a true entrepreneur. Um, number three is leverage staff. So if you've got a busy, successful practice, what if you brought in a PA? What if you brought in a nurse practitioner? So what is leverage? I mean, I think about an Allen wrench and an Allen screw. So if you put the short end of the wrench in the screw, you get more work for effort. So how can each member in your practice get best performance? How do you stay in your sweet spot? And, and how do you do what you do best? Um, next, you can keep more money. All right, so here's the deal. You know, I've, people like Travis have done a really, really great job of educating me. The biggest expense that any of us in this room will have is our lifetime tax burden. <laughs> we already talked about the fact that doctors are not financially sad. They pay huge amounts in taxes. They're among the highest percentage tax bracket of all professionals. What if they just talked to the right person or created the right corporate structure to not do anything differently but decrease their tax burden by 100, 200,000 a year? I think this is a simple overlooked solution. You know, this tax code is incredibly complex. Even if the CPA or accountant that your practice works with, you know, maybe works with other doctors, I think it's worth a second opinion. Because I think this is probably the easiest way to make more money. Um, all right. Next, collect what you earn. So, the data shows, and I'll from MTA, the average physician in private practice walks away from 30% of the reserve revenue by not following up on the targets. 30%. You just have one more outsourcing. I mean, this is a big job. Doctors are making that big on taxes. I think outsourcing is probably the single best strategy for managing cash flow. You know, with all of the ICD 10 changes, Somebody who knows the right code, who's you know not going to set up red flags, who's going to get on the phone and collect. I spoke with somebody who showed me his Porsche car. It was rejected claims. He said, "I know. I just bought it. I could afford a luxury car, but we're so busy. Nobody does it." So, um, how about your practices? How are you doing with collections? Well, what's your rejection rate on average? Yeah. And do you do this in-house? Awesome. Awesome.
Just great. It's great. <laughs> what are some other numbers? Rejection rates? You guys in the five percent range? Awesome. All right. Next, getting paid through patients. How's that going for you? <laughs> so it's very interesting. You know, your patients would not think about not paying mortgage or not paying their electrical bill because there are consequences, but somehow these medical bills feel different to them. And I just want to let you know that there are companies out there that will lend to patients for medical procedures. So the patient borrows from that organization, you get paid, and then the lender and the patient will lend you. How many of you are using that? Awesome. So, what services are you using again? Just so So one of my buddies had her entire retirement vessel by her office manager and was gone before she knew it. And now she sort of wishes that she would have paid closer attention to the expenses. So I know that there are physicians in private practice in other parts of the country who are coming together and forming an IPA. And part of that is so that they can um, purchase in scale and get discounts. Is there anything like that in this community? Great, great. Do you guys take advantage of that? How much do you think you save by doing that? So over a year, you translated that 10% into a dollar amount, a dollar amount of that, you think? And when most people do this calculation, what they find is, well, you mean I could see four more patients or I could just change vendors? You know, it's pretty easy for me.
easier for them to understand. Yeah. And I know for me, what I really liked is when my office manager would just come to me with like a real crisp, short sandwich. One page sign here. Um, all right. Third, lose less money. All right. So, have a plan for online applications. They're out there. There are crazy people out there, and they are more than happy to go online and talk all about them. So, what is your plan? So anyone, what, what do you do about that? Uh huh. Great idea. Uh -huh. All right. All right. So those, that's all great. Somebody told me an idea that it's sort of like, why didn't I think that myself? Pick up the phone and call them. Just find out why are they unhappy and see how you can make it back for them and try not to work with crazy patients. Uh-huh. Um, this might see kind of like a blend of fashion and obvious, but uh, I work in mental health, so I uh, deal with a lot of people who are um, dealing with some serious issues. Um, one of the things we found very successful dealing with unhappy people is just listening. We just, we just listen to them. Listening. And you let them, you let them deflate, and you let them talk about what they're so frustrated about, and then you apologize, and then they don't have any fuel to let, write the nasty comments or to push a lawsuit. Yeah. And I believe, you know, as somebody who served as an expert in medical malpractice lawsuit, I think the main reason that the patient sued is that somebody is going to listen to them. They are promised somebody is going to. So I, I'm absolutely. Uh huh. So, Jeff, I don't mean to put you on the spot and you don't want to do this, but what, what, what do you recommend about apologies? Like, if, you, if you've made a mistake, you've done something that you wish you didn't, how, how should that be handled? Thank you. Thank you. Um, all right. Protect against lawsuits. So there's a lot of different ways that you can get sued. A lot of vulnerability. We know about um, medical negligence, but what about lawsuits from patients? What about lawsuits from employees? I mean, patients who are tripping, not necessarily about care, but tripping your office about lawsuits. You know, if you're on social media. Every time somebody from your office posts on social media, technically it's the practice of medicine because you're disseminating information. I'll be covered for that kind of activity. I personally purchased an errors and omissions policy. It's not that expensive. But I love educating people. And I just I wanted that extra layer of protection because 
was being sued. It's already traumatic enough. So I, I wanted as many protections as possible. Anything you'd like to say about that, Joe? So, one here, more story. <laughs> so there was this physician, dermatologist, and he loved his work. He was really successful, had tens of millions of dollars in assets saved. But he still practiced because he loved it. So one day he sent his staff out to lunch. She got it in a car accident. She T-boned somebody and killed the teenager. Terrible. So um, fortunately, the teenager was well insured. But lawyers, they're always looking for the pockets, right? And this doctor had not been incorporated. And all of his assets were well in the And he lost everything. So four physicians, four healthcare professionals, make sure that you're All right, and the um, last is protection against theft, fraud, and embezzlement. So the MGMA has removed the CDF that says that healthcare is the industry that has the highest incidence of theft and fraud. So, what systems do you have in place to keep honest people honest? And taking the next steps if you have somebody who is dishonest. I will tell you that I, as a physician, tend to be pretty trusting. I tend to give people the benefit of the doubt. Unless then I told the story of having my staff on vacation, so we hired a temp, a reputable temp agency. And this woman was just the She was just so nice. She would go out in the waiting room and help the elderly patients complete their paperwork. A couple of weeks after she left, the employment agency contacted us and they discovered that she was a convicted medical doctor. So we we are at risk and anyone here? Has anyone here been the victim of theft or fraud or embezzlement? Uh -huh. what, what's it, what's your story? Oh, ouch. Ouch. So we like to think the best. <laughs> so, you know, you just might want to think about what are you doing to keep yourself protected, to keep honest people out. Any, anyone have any tips that they've used? Absolutely. So anyway, we um, I mean here is your list. So let's let's just kind of go go down this and see what we can do. Talk about some ideas for reimbursement. This is probably an ongoing project. Poverty, well get, be more successful so that you guys can all you know, contribute to your community. Resistance from doctors. Please have some compassion for them. Understand that they are just way differently than you are. And some of the ideas for you, there are no brainers, right? But for doctors, it doesn't make a lot of sense. Do you watch Shark Tank? <laughs> okay, so there was a doctor who entered the Shark Tank to get funding for his company, um, sold synthetic cadavers. He 
he already has like $10 million in sales. This is like a billion dollars in sales. This starts from our engagement plan. Yeah, and these guys need a five star deal. But then the question starts. Mr. Martin says, Tell me about your profitability. Tell me about your sales. And he said, Well, I think you can make money from money to this. One is not that important. <laughs> and those kinds of answers that I got one year with Robert Nurse back called profitability. And his, his problem. He didn't understand the charts one. And he didn't deal with that. So now that you know that doctors have this functional relationship with money, if you approach them, talk about service, because that's what's important for doctors. Talk about serving in a bigger way. Um, patient engagement. Do you have some ideas about patient engagement? Uh -huh. Okay, awesome. Um, no shows. Um, any, any thoughts about no shows? How to deal with that? We, uh, we actually green light yellow light and red light patients. Green light means that they're ready for treatment. Yellow lights, we can determine green light and red light is, means there, there is no getting in. So on the treatment point, we really quickly triage and say, look, we have serious health treatment. We do those people out there. You know, I was sued by somebody who was really understanding this one. And I decided that was it. That was the last one I did. And I do not think that there's anything wrong with saying to a patient who's not written for your culture. You know, we want you to get the best care possible. We think we're not going to be good for you. And discharging that from the practice, I think it's really good for you. That's it. Um, insurance companies, um, yeah, but as much as possible, so that you want people. Um, patient co-pays, um, how to get them and collecting from patients. You know, I, I think that as long as you're part of the insurance companies, you're going to have these problems. If this is a systems problem, you're going to have this frustration. And um, so part part of the cost of doing business with the insurance company is dealing with this kind of hassle and just know that there are alternatives. We speak with plenty of doctors who have all the cash practices in the very well. It's always an option. Um, patients don't understand insurance. Again, part of this, physician burnout. I do believe that if we help more people live in their sweet spot, and do the things that they love to do. They're not going to do that. You need to have those things, right? You need to go to and you need to just like, hmm. I love my family so much. Okay, so the question is, what can we do to have more of those days? What kinds of things can we get rid of? How can we spend more time in your sweet spot? And I think we are better than every single person. Um, delegation. Um, I, I think it's key. You know, if you have this idea of a sweet spot, like my friend Susie and I, she took care of the kids and I did cooking. We both loved what we were doing. How many of those win win relationships can you set up so that you're calling on your kids and you're delegating away things that you don't like to do and you're not as good at? Um, access to care. Um, I, it breaks my heart. It just breaks my heart. I uh, need an opinion. What, what do you guys have to say about the system's problem access? <laughs> yeah, I'm sorry. I didn't yeah, it's like you said, partly the insurance company panels, if you can be in, higher up to the All right. So if don't don't put up barriers yourself against that's a practice to allow patients access to this And this last one, I think it's a really good one. And if you think about it, okay, how long did I invest in becoming a Four years of undergraduate, four years of medical school, five years of residency. That's a long time. 
It's important to invest in my practice and have a strategic vision for what I want to do. It might be a hard sell. It might be something that you could take back. I mean, what do you think about us getting together? And we've been talking about a few years ago and take this back. I have this thriving down the food camp. You're welcome to participate in the food camp. I think that this is an excellent investment. I don't think any time you become successful without sitting down and fighting out the best way to get So, anyway, we talked about a lot of stuff. So, just to summarize, the new rule Asians are behaving like consumers. That means if you want to be successful in public service, you have to yourself like a business person. And under the business rules, you Patient people exchange money for value. So how well do you understand what the patient's and the physician's value? And how can you give them more of that? Um, we talked about a strategic approach and not trying to be all things to help patients, but finding your sweet spot, gathering intelligence, and have more insight about what inspires patients to take action. Um, we talked about this makeover, you know, the physician statement, what do you do that everyone can say? Um, want marketing campaigns, relationship marketing, educational marketing, community marketing, cultivate these culture introductions. So let's, you know, you can just say to patients, I am here to serve. And, you know, there are patients out there suffering in silence, you know, the incontinence or whatever. We need to have a here. We always welcome the opportunity to provide information for a people. So this isn't about you, this is not saying I want to build my practice, or this is not about the person making the introduction. You know, I need you to do this, this is part of me. Like, no, you have to serve the people who are destined to use your services. And, uh, and then it's important to test and measure. So you do that with empathy. Marketing resources are a little bit sure that, that you do that same thing, and then you find out there's nine ways to generate more revenue, you can earn more, keep more, or lose less. I hope that this was helpful. And I will be here for another hour or so, so if there are any questions that I might be able to answer, I, I would appreciate it. There's one last thing that I just want to end with, and that's that I think we as professionals, we like to be the leaders. We like to help people. We don't like being vulnerable and we don't like asking for help. But what I've come to understand is that we're in a circle of giving and receiving. I'll tell you how I came to understand this. So I went to this community meeting, and everyone at the meeting got an envelope. Said, don't open the envelope until we tell you. And so we said, now. So we all opened the envelope, and there was a letter. And Chris fifty dollars book fell off. And it said, Dear community member, um, this fifty dollars is my gift to you. If you need it, please, you know, use it. However, I want to tell you a story. There was a point when somebody gave me a gift of fifty dollars in an interview And I always told myself that I would pass this along. So my myself to say, you see now, I want to do it. So if you don't need it, please pass it along. But here's the rule. You can't just give it to an organization. You need to give it to a person. And I thought this was a good one for the members. And um, the opportunity just didn't seem right. October rolls up November. December, I took a friend of mine to see the ophthalmologist. And he was spoken about the ophthalmologist. So we were sitting outside the door of a little elevator opera. I heard this woman saying, this was killed. And, um, and the voice got louder. And what I saw was this disheveled woman walking with a watch and um, singing these Christmas carols. And I said to her, it looks like you really like Christmas. And she just smiled and said, yes. And I could see all the teeth and all the same. And then it was kind of like a cloud. She said, I don't know. 
So I went to my purse, like the fifty dollars was in the bottom. I said, "This is for you. This is the story of how I got it." She said, "Well, I can't take it. You know, I'm never going to be able to repay." I said, "That's okay. Just like tell the story." And she looked at me and it was like I didn't have any dollars. So the elevator door opens. She hops on the elevator and she says, "God bless you." And I said, and had I not been in a position to receive, I wouldn't have been able to do it. So I know that you are generous to the Please be willing to receive it, to be your part of it. Because the challenges that we're facing are tough challenges. And you just never know what to do. So thank you again for the following privilege to be here.